Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Take a Stand. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson. And boy, oh boy, this morning I have got, I'm going to say, one of the loveliest people I have ever met oh. uh, in terms of what she does for her community and how much heart she puts into everything she absolutely does. So I want to welcome to the show today, Leslie Delp. Leslie is, and the topic that we're going to talk about today is like how the Fire Breathing Dragon actually started a non profit organization. So let me tell you a little bit about Leslie. So she is a psychologist who actually specializes in bereavement therapy. She created a, um, a program called Hearts Can Heal and it's a, it's a children's bereavement support program. And she also is the founder of Olivia's House, which is one of the largest organizations also recognized as one of the premier grief centers throughout all of America. So I want to welcome her to the show today. I've asked her to be here because I really wanted to have a chat with her about what it is that she has, like how has she come to be doing what she's doing right now in terms of why did she choose that as the thing that she was going to stand up for and stand firm on and then what are the things that she's actually doing to stand out in her industry now? How does somebody actually get to, you know, from just an idea or a passion inside of her head and inside of her heart to being one of the you know premier grief centers in all of America. So through today's conversation, we're going to unfold all of that. We're going to be talking about this fire breathing dragon. We're going to be talking about the journey that she's had, the ups and the downs, and some of the things that she has done that has really helped her to stay firm and to start you know, being to, to continue to be very balanced throughout her entire journey as a very successful business owner. So like I said, welcome to the show, Leslie. Wonderful to have Thank you here. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always wonderful to see you. And I, I really, um, I love the topic. I'm very passionate about women having um, a goal and, and, and showing their children that I can be a wonderful mother and I also can fulfill my dreams. And uh, for me, being a mom to my children was my dream. That's really all I ever wanted to be was a wife and mother. Um, so all of a sudden though, I realized that um, my son's Ninja Turtles were more important than I was. And my daughter's bus ride to school with her girlfriends were more important than I was. And I knew I needed to then kind of look at what else do I wanna do with my life that would enhance them, um, but would also bring my spirit some peace. So I have a teacher spirit, I think, Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a degree in education and I have a degree in psychology. But I've married those two degrees and I really like to teach. I like to teach about why the brain does what it does. I like to teach how the emotions and the brains are connected. And, and so I am a teacher. I was a professor at uh, York College in my town of York, Pennsylvania. I was a professor for 10 years. I taught death and dying and I taught sociology. So I really believe in community. I believe in making the place where you live and the world we live in a better place. I, I wanted to leave a footprint on the planet and I wanted that footprint to be a beautiful footprint and something oh. that children could be proud of. Yeah. You are doing that in a big way. So oh. let's um, let's talk about like when, when was that moment? So being a professor and, and sort of teaching and mm -hmm. then there was this moment of, actually, I feel like I want to do something more. Like you were talking about, you know, I want to leave a footprint in this world. I want to do something big. And what was that moment and how did that even come about? Like to, to, to be doing, going from being a professor teaching to now being the owner and the founder of a very large not-for-profit organization in this particular field, how did that come about? That's a great question. And, you know, in many ways, when I think back, it feels like it was yesterday. And in many ways, it feels like it was 10 lifetimes ago. I am so not the woman 
um, who said, I think I want to start this. <laughs> it's not her anymore. I'm 62. I'm looking at retiring um, soon. And, and, and I love looking back. And right now we're doing a virtual tour of Olivia's house um, on camera so that when people go to our website, they can take this virtual tour through all the rooms and learn the history of how I decided what I decided and why is there that chair in the corner? Because there's a story to that chair and I want them to know the story. And so we're we're looking at the history and I'm, I'm thinking back about who I was when I made some of these decisions 20 years ago. Um, so that's interesting, but it all boils down to, I have a child that died in utero, never got to have a lifetime with that child. And I, I didn't feel like my needs were met when that happened. So I really, when my children were finally um, of age to be in school and be busy and, and like I say, not really need me the same way they did when they were babies, uh, I thought it's time now to give Christopher a lifetime and to speak to those needs that have not been resolved in me from when he died. Um, so that was in 1980. So you can imagine how different bereavement was for women back in 1980. Um, and we have come such a far way and we still have a long way to go, but we, we've come so far. But that that was my passion was to resolve some of these issues that I saw happen um, when he died. And, and so the bottom line was I went back to graduate school. I got a counseling degree and I started working with mothers who lost children. And I thought that was what my clientele was going to be. But mm -hmm. before I knew it, I was working with children who lost mothers. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because I had an elementary education degree and a psych degree, and now a counseling, you know, master's degree, the marriage of all of that just felt so right when I would be sitting with a child and they were mourning the loss of their mother. It just felt so right for me to be able to explain to them what's happening in their little bodies on a level that they could understand because I was an elementary school teacher and I had even done a stint in preschool. So we have a program that starts at age three. And that's because, you know, God led me to get a degree, a pre preschool kind of concentration, if you will. So I have all of these building blocks um, that happened not because I was smart and decided that's what I needed. It was just quite by serendipity, quite God's plan. And so whenever I was contemplating making any next move or change in my life, or even this big shift of, I want to start a children's bereavement center where all the kids can come together to meet one another. Even in doing that, you know, I really prayed about it and I really let you know, the energy of all of that lead me. And I, I am somebody with a real strong intuition and gut instinct about people, mm -hmm. about experiences. And I listen to my intuition and I listen to my gut. And um, I am always glad that I do. I'm always glad when I give that space and, and listen to those energies, tell me what way I need to go. Um, in the case of building Olivia's house, though, I had a mentor that I met quite by accident. I went to a lecture one day and I just mm -hmm. so happened to be writing my thesis, which was a children's bereavement camp. It had never been done. And I thought, what better place to talk to kids about grief and loss than in a camp setting? I mean, who wouldn't, what kid wouldn't want to do that, you know? So I was creating a bereavement camp called Camp Mend a Heart. and this gentleman was writing a book and I went to his lecture and he was saying to the audience how he was writing this book. And the one thing he was missing in his book though, was about this concept about bereavement camps for children. I'm like, I can tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> and so after the lecture, I went up and spoke to him and he said, I would love to have you put a page in my book and write a page about your camp in my book. And Tracy, I was nobody. I didn't know anything. I was nobody. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have a page in a book written by this guy? He's mm -hmm. like the world's expert on this. I mean, Oprah Winfrey was friends with him. Mm -hmm. At the time, I, I was just like, seriously, you want to know what I think? 
So I wrote the page and then I, I sent everything for my thesis to him about this camp. And he became quite enamored with what I was trying to do. I think he was shocked and surprised, quite frankly, that I had done what I'd done. And um, I was just meeting the needs of children. So Isn't it really, what I found, like even just in this this short, um, you know, description of, of, of that journey that you've had, mm -hmm. how interesting is it that often we start out in like the business world, right? We've got an idea in our head and we're moving forward with that. Mm -hmm. But what you did was very much sit with that sit mm -hmm. with it for a while, ensure it, like, what's my gut telling me? What's my intuition telling me? And then you started to, you know, then you started to move forward with that. And a lot of what you've talked about, I know we, we were having a chat behind um, behind the scenes before we jumped on live and just very much everything that you've done has been very led by that, hasn't it, Leslie? Like in terms yeah. of like, what's my gut telling me? What's the right timing to do things? For other women who are out there that are like, and, and I think the other thing that I'm recognizing that you're doing and that I'm seeing with a lot of other very successful women is that they, again, when we start out, we don't always think about all of the skills that we have. Mm -hmm. What you've done very beautifully is go, well, I have, you know, I've, I know I've got knowledge here and I've got some knowledge here and I've got that expert knowledge over mm -hmm. here too. Mm -hmm. And then very, um, easily been able to combine all of those into something that is very unique. Mm -hmm. And that is that it's often the piece that is missing in a lot of people's, um, and we're gonna get to kind of this, I wanna talk mm -hmm. about passion too, but often, you know, when we start out with something that's very we're very passionate about, and we're doing it in a silo, and we're we're often forgetting about bringing in the other components of the knowledge and the information mm -hmm. and the experiences that we have, we end up with a very almost like a siloed uh, type situation. But what you've done is been able to bring all of that in, and it's become very holistic in the way in which you have incorporated it. The other interesting thing was that you started out with this healing yourself mm -hmm. like very much coming at it from a point of view of i need to start this because i need it yeah and then very quickly recognizing with well what i'm doing and i thought i was going to be helping you know other mums here but it's actually not the other mums that i need to be helping with all the skill set that i've got it's the children right. so let, let's um let's talk about this the fire breathing dragon piece right. like i know um, yeah. You say, yeah, how the fire dream, how the fire breathing dragon started a non for profit. So, what is this all about? What's the fire dream? Oh, so fire mentor, breathing dragon. Yeah, my mentor, Dr. Alan Wolfelt, um, he and I worked together, you know, for a, a little while. And I just trusted him and I admired him so much. And anytime he did lectures, I would try to get to them. Um, his center was in Colorado, so it was the other side of the country. But I would go whenever I could to anything he was doing nearby. And one time um, I said to my husband, I'm going to call Alan and I'm going to see if he has any wisdom about the timing. Because I, I had originally wanted to do a big farm. It was called Healing Hearts Farm. And I I, I told you, I, I looked at an $800,000 farm. And after touring the farm and doing a business plan and creating a model of what it would look like, put a lot of sweat equity into it, it I just got scared that I was not going to have time for my children. And the impetus for this whole passionate mission was that I have children, they were gifts, and I didn't get to raise Christopher, and I don't want to lose out on raising the other two. So I backed off that mission. But when I felt my gut said it's time, I called Alan. And I said, I think it's time for me to do this, Alan. Is there any wisdom? I know you have a, a loss center for adults in Colorado. I want to, I want to create one for families where the the emphasis on the children, and then we teach the adults what children need. And I you know, shared my thoughts, my vision, and he basically said, when you begin, your dream will become a fire-breathing dragon. It will get up in the morning very early, it will come out of its cave, and it will breathe fire all day long. It will breathe and you won't get up, you won't get any rest. 
So do you have people around you who can give you rest, who can say, I'll stand in for you, go take five minutes of breathing. Do you have people that when you say, I'm so thirsty, does anybody have water that will hand you water? When you drop your sword and that dragon is breathing down your neck, do you have someone to hand you one? Do you have what it takes to fight that dragon and push him back into that cave at the end of the evening? And do you have what it takes when he gets up the next morning and comes out of that cave again? Because he will every mm -hmm. single morning. Are you ready for that? And I thought long and hard, and that was my measuring stick. And I talked to my children and I talked to my husband and we went clear to Seattle to meet a woman at a conference who was going to teach us how to start centers. I thought, oh, perfect. Here's a lady who's done it. I'm going to go talk to her. Took a credit card, maxed it out with our plane, our conference fee. Um, our hotels, took my children, pretended it was a vacation, went to meet this lady at the conference. I mean, literally, Tracy, we had no money, but I maxed out a credit card to go. Mm -hmm. How passionate I was and how much I thought I could, I, it was time to do this. I got out there and she was sick and she didn't show. And there was no one at that conference who was going to do any workshops on this topic. The only thing I came for, I wasn't going to get. And I went into the bookstore and I started to kind of cry because I didn't know how to tell my husband. And uh, the bookstore owner said, what are you crying about? And I told her and she said, where do you live? I said, York, Pennsylvania. And she said, I know a man in York, Pennsylvania. And if you talk to him, he'll build you that center. And I thought she was crazy and I thought she was just kidding me. But that man did build me the center. Wow, it, that took gives me five, it took about five years to finally connect with him, to sell him on what I needed and wanted to do. And ironically, he was in the funeral home industry. He was in the casket making industry. And he said that was something he wanted for his, it was a passion of his to help children. And he said, I build the caskets, but I want to help them understand why this casket is so important. It holds their mama. It holds their daddy. It holds their sibling. And I, I asked him, can you help me? And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need a house. He said, I'll get you a house. And he signed the mortgage. He mortgaged his own home to make sure I had a mortgage free and clear for that house. Wow. Mm -hmm. That isn't it, like <laughs> you say serendipity, right? You know, you yeah. think, oh, boy, I've gone all this way. I've maxed out a credit card. I've put my family in this situation. Yeah. I've come all this way for nothing. And then to yeah. find yourself, you know, in a in a pile in a bookstore in a just an off chance uh, yeah. meeting with somebody and mm -hmm. boom, the rest is like the rest becomes mm -hmm. history, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. tell me why like most people would go down the path, like when you're thinking about putting a business together, even if you're like you're super passionate about it, mm -hmm. many go down the for profit route. Why mm -hmm. did you go down the nonprofit route? Like, what great, was, did you yeah. weigh up those two two options, and why did you choose the nonprofit route for you? I think that a lot of my success has become has come from naivety. Um, I really didn't know what I didn't know, and I have been blessed because, like I said, I really do feel that God had put this on my heart, and and that Christopher's legacy in life was really about this. I had learned early on that when your child dies before it has a lifetime, that, you know, their legacy is their lifetime. And so for me, whatever I did, it was going to be those birthday parties I didn't get to have. And it was going to be those school pictures that I didn't get to have. So I was passionate in that I, I felt strongly that, well, this is Christopher's lifetime, so I can't really fail. So, uh, so uh, my, my naivety took me down the road of a nonprofit business, but there was a switch about 10 years in, I realized this is not a charity. This is a mm -hmm. for-profit business. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. I have been running it like a charity 
And I was afraid to spend any money on anything that wasn't necessary, including myself. I worked for two years without a salary. Well, looking back on that, I would never advise anybody to do that unless they absolutely had to. Um, but but these are the things I learned. And one of the things that that really shifted then was my community was behind me the whole way and they were very involved in building the house. We had a, at least 100 volunteers every Saturday morning renovating this whole big 29 room house that George bought for me. Um, and so I, I had the communities buy in and I had their support and they, they were every fundraiser I ever held, they were there and they helped me raise money. But after 10 years, you're not the new kid on the block anymore. Mm -hmm. And your charity isn't the, you know, the shiny marble that, mm -hmm. you know, the kids want to play with. And so the next new thing that comes along, um, that's what gets all the focus. And that's where the newspapers want to go for the articles. So you have to learn how to sustain it. And I took a lot of different classes. Um, in our town, we have a nonprofit organization that supports all our nonprofits. So it gives you trainings. It helps you build your board. It helps you find board members that are legitimate and will really work for you. It helps you to know how to raise money the right way and not have it out of balance where you have more money going into a fundraiser than you're actually making. Um, believe it or not, there are people who like to take advantage of good nonprofits that have great reputations because they kind of slide in on their coattails. Mm -hmm. And how do you prevent that from happening? So I, I took all of those workshops and I did everything I could to learn everything that I didn't know. And then the key, and this is one piece of wisdom I give to everyone out there, surround yourself with good people. Oh, surround yeah. yourself with people who know how to do what you don't know how to do. Surround yourself with some of the experts in the field where you just, there's just no way I knew anything about electrical work or construction or any of that. I didn't even know how to design things. I'm not a design person. So I got those great people in my community who were the best at it. And I don't want to use the word manipulated, but I conned them and helped me. <laughs> and they loved it because their talents were going to be put to use in a really wonderful way. And they were going to be showcased in this beautiful home that was going to welcome these children. And the healing that has happened there, because those people took their talents and joined them with my ideas and my energies, you know, that's just, that's just the neatest synergy ever. Um, so, so I never I stopped finding those people. I couldn't agree with you more. Surrounding yourself with the right people absolutely yeah. helps to, it gives you insulation, it gives you momentum. And just, yeah. you know, when you've got a, a bunch of people around you, you are just able to go much, much further, yeah. faster. You know, yeah. when you're doing it on your own, you can only go so far, but you can go a long way if you've got a lot of good people around you. I've got a few questions for you now. So one is um, you mentioned that, you know, you, you in the early days, you mm -hmm. started out and you weren't taking any, like you took no salary, nothing. Mm -mm. And your advice would be, don't do that. Let's right. go there. Why? What 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 would you what would you do differently? And what advice would you give to somebody? And why would you advise not to do that? Well, I was very fortunate because my husband had a really good job. So he bankrolled a lot of things that most people have no clue he bankrolled. And he also supported me. We lived on his salary very comfortably. So um, I just never felt like I was worthy of much. And I, I, and I don't know if that's just my background from my childhood. I, you know, my parents both had suffered from mental illness and I just never felt worthy of asking for what I was really probably should have asked for. So I didn't. Plus I had this mentality of, I don't want to sink the ship I'm building. So mm -hmm. if I give myself a top heavy salary, what message is that sending? And I'm asking everyone else to volunteer. So what message am I sending? But then, like I said, as I, as I started moving through this mission and recognizing it for the gifts it was giving and the, the value of these children as they were coming back and telling me how their life was changed, I started to realize, you know what? If I don't, if I'm not here, then they can't heal. I'm the service. I'm the person that has the answers. I'm the one that can 
teach them where they need to go. So if I'm not here to teach, then, you know, if I can't protect me, then I can't protect them. That old adage of put your, you know, your um, oxygen mask on yourself first. So yes. that's kind of where I went with it after a few years. And I realized I've got to make enough of a salary that I feel worthy to go out and ask somebody else to do what I do. If I was going to have to replace me, I would need to pay a lot of money to get me. So why am I not asking for some of that? So it, it was a shift in my thinking. It took a while. A lot of that happened, Tracy, when my son came to work with me. And that was some um, several years in. He graduated from college with a degree in marketing and communication and film and uh, television. So he's got, again, like me, three degrees. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he was valuable, but I didn't want to cheat him. But you've got levels of employees, so you've got to balance all that. And HR being what it was, I learned a lot about that. And, and that's what helped get our salaries in line. And then I got some great board members who got behind me and said, you're not making enough for what you do. You have a master's degree and 10 years experience. You need to make more than this. Uh -huh. So they, they were instrumental, the board, in saying, no, Leslie, you're not asking for enough and we're going to give you this. And that's how that happened. Isn't it interesting that, you know, often as, as women too, like that whole scenario of you thinking, you know, okay, so I'm doing a not for profit, I'm I'm um or a non-profit and I'm I'm asking all these other people to volunteer. So therefore, you know, I, I shouldn't be doing, you know, I shouldn't be receiving anything for it either. Yeah. And then yeah. having those um those challenges with oneself about, you know, our our self-worth and am I worthy of receiving that and what will people think of me? And then waiting. So as women, we we often wait for somebody else to say, the board to say, actually, Leslie, you need to be yeah. paying yourself. You know, I can only imagine how long that may wow. have gone on for had the board not come in and said, Leslie, mm. you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that you're like, I'm prepared to pay somebody else and I can see their worth. Mm -hmm. but I can't always see my own. And so as a woman, you know, that's that's fundamental. And, and we, yeah. so many uh, women I know, you know, we go through that. And, and if you can do. afford it, your husband will, you'll manage, you will just make do so that you can, you can support others. But like you say, yeah. we must put that oxygen mask on first. The other thing I want to ask is with any non-profit, or any business for that matter, mm -hmm. um, getting the support of the community. So in in non for profit, we would talk about getting the support of your community. In a for profit, you might be talking about, especially if you're in the online space, you know, the support of your tribe, right? Mm -hmm. Same same type of concept. How did you get them to to? Because there's a fundamental piece in all of this, right? And it's that connectedness to the mission. Mm -hmm. Or the the mm -hmm. the um yeah the mission that you are that you are trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. What did you do, and how important has that been in the success of Olivia's House? Now, how did you get your community to be connected to the message or and the mission that you were trying to create? Well, grief and loss for children is universal. You know, they're around the globe and they're hurting and. For me and my community, you know, I had been, before I built Olivia's house, I had been running Hearts Can Heal for about five or six years. So I had roughly um, 50 children who had already graduated from that program. So they were like little walking billboards. And when it came time to put a face to what we were talking about, up pops Olivia. You know, a little six-year-old girl whose mother died in a car accident, leaving her. And and she was just the best face for the mission. And she came to me quite, again, serendipitously with with the internet. My, my, my son was playing around with my Facebook, or excuse me, my uh, website, and, and we connected. And when, when I talked to Olivia's grandmother about the fact that I wanted to do this and I love the name Olivia, and then I told you, you know, my grandmother who was a bereaved child and I connected with Olivia Walton on the television show, The Waltons, when Olivia's mother named her after her, I just knew we were connected. So Olivia came to be every child. And to say that she and I didn't 
like storm the county together would be an understatement. I mean, we went everywhere together. And she and her grandmother and her grandfather and myself, we would go to churches on Sunday mornings and, and share the message. We would go to civic groups, all of the you know, different kinds of lions clubs and rotaries. And I don't know in Australia if you have that, but we have mm -hmm. tons of them in every community. And they're mm -hmm. always looking for somebody to speak and to share what's happening in their community and how can they get involved as a volunteer. So I just, I had already done a nonprofit for cancer patients. I had begun a, a cancer patient support program. So I knew the ins and outs of that. Um, and so this was just another way for me to say to my community at the Rotary events and at the, at the different um, Lions Clubs, we need your help. And the house we purchased sat right on the edge of a college campus where I was a professor. So I went to the college and we had a huge unveiling of our mission and what we wanted to do to all of the people you know, that are associated with the college. We have what's called a junior league, which is women who love to do philanthropic things for our community. So we've invited them and they were our hostesses. And I just knew all of the people that would talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a whole year going around every Sunday to a different church. I got churches involved. I got funeral directors involved. I invited them all to this thing at the college. I, I just laid the red carpet out for as many people as I could so that they understood this is going to be your house because one day you're going to walk through at the doorway and you're going to want what we have to give you. And I don't know when you'll walk through the door, but you will. And when you do, you're going to feel comfortable because you built it. And it wasn't long, Tracy, before one of the men who was instrumental in helping us get started, he raised a lot of money. He was just a sweetheart. He had very young children. He and his wife helped me. And uh, he went through a health crisis. And on the medication, he was really not himself. And he ended his life. Mm -hmm. And his kids were now teenagers. And when she walked through the door with those teenagers, she said to me, you told me that when we started helping you, that I might end up coming back through this door for services. And I never in a million years thought I would. And I didn't think it would be because he was not here with me. So I have seen it all. And I have always enjoyed the fact that I promised them this mission was their mission. This was mm. their house. It wasn't my house. It's not named after me. It's not even named after Christopher. It is named after Olivia. And Olivia represents every child. And uh, and it is their house. And when they walk through it, it's because they built it. And it's because they sustained it. That's the big I think that's really, um, you know, that that whole scenario of how you went about doing that because to, to, to create any like a, a business that has longevity something that is um, sustainable but profitable for the long term needs to be built on solid foundation mm -hmm. and that solid foundation and is and the the installation that you have created around the business mm -hmm. is being the community. So they're mm. like the pillars that are mm. holding everything up. And yeah. I think the, th the clear thing that has come through with this is that you really knew what your mission was. You were very, mm. very clear about that, mm -hmm. meaning that you were then able to go out and articulate that to mm. others in a way that was compelling and allowed them to be part of it. So quite often from a, a business standpoint, whenever we're doing you know, some sort of presentation where you're, you're presenting a, mm. a opportunity to somebody else, often we forget about how we can include that audience in mm. the uh, you know, in the scenario, because mm -hmm. if you can include them in it and they feel like they are part of it, like you're mm -hmm. saying, it's not mm -hmm. my house, it's not even Christopher's house, it's your mm -hmm. house, mm -hmm. then when it becomes yours 
um, mm -hmm. everybody involved, then mm -hmm. they want to be, you feel like an, that real connection mm -hmm. to it and you want mm -hmm. to do something to help mm -hmm. and to continue to support it. So I think that's been fundamental. But then the second thing that you, that uh, I'm seeing you really did um, well was you really understood your audience. So mm. not just the audience of it's little children that I'm going to be helping, but my audience of who are the people that can actually help me do this and where are they congregating? <laughs> you know, where are they mm -hmm. congregating? Where, where, where do I find these these congregations of people yeah. and you very strategically went to those places with mm -hmm. a very clear message with a very clear mission and a very clear way of how you could get them involved mm -hmm. and all of those things um certainly when i'm you know helping people work through their business plan because that's another thing mm -hmm. that i have done a lot of in my past mm -hmm. is these are all fundamental things that we need to be mm -hmm. thinking about and you've mm -hmm. must you know, it sounds like you did them very intuitively you know you mm -hmm. just you that's where I should be going that's what I should be doing yeah. but being able to think about yeah. those yeah mm -hmm. at the outset when you're planning your business is really important well and you know I I really um think that the most important lesson or wisdom that was given to me early on I held what was called a focus group which was I pulled in about 10 people um George was one of them um but 10 people I knew who had different skill sets and were very high profile in the community, but weren't so high profile that they would take a look at me and think, I don't have time for you. So these 10 people got together and I told them what I wanted to do. And they were my barometer. You know, they were my, I thought if they blow me off, then maybe we're not ready, but they didn't. But the one thing they said to me was, well, loss is so huge, Leslie. You know, you you could help with these kids with divorce because that's like a loss. And you can help with adoption because that's a loss. And, and of course, death is a loss. And then you got kids moving around with, with deployment. You know, we could do that. And I said, you know, I know death. I experienced death. I'm working through death and will be until I take my last breath. My child... That process is lifelong. So that I know well. I've never been divorced. I celebrate 41 years of marriage this weekend, Tracy. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know I'm happily married. Um, mm -hmm. I I don't, you know, I just, I know what I know. And, and it oozes out of me because I, I have internalized this pain. And I said, so what I want to do is I want to do what I know how to do well. And mm -hmm. there's a thing called mission creep, where before mm -hmm. you know it, people are giving you reasons and opportunities to creep outside your mission statement. And I learned from those workshops that I attended how to draft a really good, strong mission statement. So when somebody says, can you do this? I can point right to my mission statement and say, we're an organization of caregiving professionals and volunteers who Provide edge grief and loss education for children after the death of a loved one. That's what we do. And mm -hmm. that has been successful because I think had I tried to do it all, I, I would have failed. So my yeah. wisdom to everyone starting with their passion and whatever it is, is draw a very tight uh, mission statement and stay true to it. And your vision is statement can be broader but your mission statement needs to be tight and your 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 gifts and your talents need to be enveloped in that mission statement. Does that mean? I think that sense? is invaluable advice because, you know, that that mission creep, scope creep, uh, project <laughs> creep, it happens everywhere if you it allow does. it to. And yes. by being very, very, again, you're just being very clear and concise with, what it is that you do, how you go about doing it, and that's just going to hold you, you know, allow you to remain absolutely focused on that mission and not be distracted by other shiny objects. So I know I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I think today we've had a fantastic conversation. I think there's so many things that we have um we've shared or you've shared with our audience and if they listen really carefully to some of the things and that uh, Leslie has shared today about the pitfalls that mm -hmm. fire breathing dragon and that you know are you prepared because 
it, your passion is only going to take you so far. Yeah. You know, she said you want to have that good support around you because that's the mm. thing that's going to take you to the next level. When your mm. passion wanes and you're looking at this fire breathing dragon and it's right in your mm. face and you feel like mm. your face is being burnt off, your community is going to keep you, you know, is going to keep you going. So you want to make sure you've got all of that and you're very, yeah. very clear on what your mission is and just stay true and firm to that. Yeah. And I want to say congratulations to Leslie because, oh. you know, starting out and just, it's tough, right? I mean, and mm. going down the path of a non-for-profit, even, you know, that's a whole different ball game. Mm. If you're you're starting out your own business and you're making a dollar from the first, you know, from day one, mm. um, you know, it's almost like, wow, that's amazing. But a mm. non-for-profit, when you've got to work so hard to try and convince, you know, yeah. convince enough people to get behind your mission and what you're doing, that takes a lot of mm -hmm. time, energy, persistence, tenacity, mm -hmm. you name it. It's it's mm -hmm. it's all there, uh, mm -hmm. whilst also trying to slay that dragon at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations Thank on uh, 41 years of marriage and being so successful in what you do and just helping so many oh. Uh, wonderful children that need your help so thank you for doing that and thanks, thanks again for being on the show i want to say to everybody else thank you very much for listening in today i hope you've enjoyed the session with leslie i always enjoy my conversations with her um, and like i said there's so many little gems that have been threaded throughout uh, to this morning's conversation so you can tune in again on another episode of take a stand i'll be back again next week with another episode uh, you will be hearing from the beautiful uh, linda sterling next week who is is actually our book publisher so if you haven't already got your hands on a copy of the Shemith book you want to do so uh, she's the amazing woman that helped us actually publish that book so you'll be hearing from her hearing her story how she actually created the publishing company that she's got right now and uh, we'll be back again next Thursday for another episode of Take a Stand so thanks very much everybody have an amazing rest of the week and I'll see you again next week bye for now bye bye